So uh, thanks very much for the invitation to come and speak. It's really great to be here. Um, I'm here to talk a little bit about uh, how our group tries to approach these really complex biological systems where um, you know, I trained as a physicist where there's a fairly small number of things and a small number of ways they interact. And in biology, there's way too many things and they interact in way too many ways. So um, how do we deal with this incredible complexity? And so a lot of the tools that we develop are organized around trying to help you know, sort of cross different spatial and temporal scales. Um, but the idea being that doing that will allow us to detect patterns that uh, might not be, be uh, completely visible if we only zoom in to a tiny little spot or if we only look at things at a very coarse level. And so a lot of our focus is on neuroscience where, you know, in the human uh, brain, you know, we have uh, brain cells are enormous. They can be centimeters in spatial extent. And yet if you care about, say, the connection between two neurons in the brain, you're dealing with nanoscale things organized quite often with nanoscale precision. So how can you visualize and control and, uh, and understand across these different spatial scales, if, which is what you need to do if you want to understand you know, a sensation or a thought or a feeling or something. And then, of course, there's time, which you've already been hearing about. Uh, you know, these are extremely fast events that occur in brain cells and many other physiological systems. And uh, you know, in, in neurons, of course, you have millisecond time scale changes where uh, you know, uh, electrical signals within cells and chemical exchanges between cells and understanding how those are generated and integrated across uh, you know, networks towards behavior is still a very big problem. So I'll tell you a couple of short stories today, uh, some about space and some about time, with the goal being to give a flavor for how we're trying to synthesize different kinds of scientific disciplines in order to build technologies that can allow us to, to conquer these two big hurdles. So let's start with space. And, um, this is a story that goes back quite some, some ways in our group. Uh, we were really trying to figure out ways to image the distribution and location and identity of biomolecules throughout cells, throughout neural networks. And of course, there are many pioneering approaches for doing that. Electron microscopy, super resolution imaging. There have been many approaches which uh, have been proposed and, and applied to this problem. But still, when we started really trying to do brain imaging, uh, we had this issue where uh, nothing really allowed us to image large scale, three dimensional objects like brain circuits and still have nanoscale resolution uh, and molecular identity performance. So starting with, uh, with two grad students then in the lab, uh, Fei Chen and Paul Tilburg, and uh, this project grew until now, it's almost half of my group, we decided what if we try to do the opposite of what everybody's doing? If we really want to see the structure of the nervous system with molecular precision at scale, what if instead of zooming in, we blew everything up? And so the basic idea is, what if we can take the kinds of swallowable polymers that you find, for example, in baby diapers, synthesize them into three-dimensional spiderweb-like meshes, and do it so densely and so evenly that when we apply water and swell the polymer, we could pull all the biomolecules apart from each other. So there's two veins of research that go back many decades to which we, we owe a debt. One is um, from the physicist Toyochi Tanaka, who had uh, been at MIT, and around the year, uh, late 1970s, early 1980s, was really starting to look at you know, phase transitions in polyelectrolyte hydrogels. So these are highly charged polymers of the size of a certain topology. Um, you add water, the water gets absorbed, um, and uh, 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 first there was a force, and then of course you get charge repulsion um, as you decrowd the polymers from each other and have less charge screening. Um, and so you get these thousand-fold or even bigger volumetric changes in these substances, which anybody who's had a kid with a baby diaper has seen this kind of thing in action. But of course, you have to get these polymers inside the specimen, right? And so there's a second line of research, which goes back also around to the early 1980s, um, originated by Christine Dreyer at the Max Planck Institute, and then followed by many others, which is to take biological specimens and embed them in hydrogels for imaging purposes. So uh, around the same time that Tanaka was exploring these uh, highly charged ionic gels, uh, she was taking uh, tissues and embedding them in uh, charged neutral polyacrylamide gels in order to facilitate their imaging. And so we started thinking, wow, you know, there are different uh, strategies that you could really bring together and, you know, a lot of science is connecting the dots. Um, and so the idea that we started to really think about was could you actually synthesize a dense three-dimensional spiderweb-like gel, pull the biomolecules apart and take a cell and expand it into sort of a constellation of biomolecules hovering in space but ideally tethered so that, the, so that the relative organization is preserved. So to do that, we had to invent a couple chemistries and um, shown in these cartoons. And so this first cartoon, you know, we have some biomolecules shown in brown. And what we've done is develop a whole suite of anchors that can bind to DNA, RNA, proteins, and so forth, so that we can apply force to the biomolecules and pull them apart from each other. 
So for example, we have uh, various chemicals that can covalently attach to key amino acids. We can attach to key bases in the genome or in RNA. Um, and you can apply these in cocktails as well. So you can pull apart DNA, RNA, and proteins. You know, we, our goal is really to deconstruct all these different building blocks of life eventually. Then we can apply protocols very similar to what Dreyer published you know, 30 years ago. Um, you can do free radical polymerization and synthesize with dense and topologically appropriate organization these threads and weave them around and between the biomolecules. And when these threads encounter one of these anchors, if we've designed them properly, then they'll bind. And so now we have the force generation strategy, the polymer swelling, and we have the force conveyance strategy, the anchors. There's one final step, and this is actually in some ways maybe the trickiest. Biomolecules, many of them don't like to be separated. So we have to come up with strategies to loosen them up from each other using enzymes, heat treatment, and detergents, and so forth. And then when we add water, the polymers will swell, just like I showed you earlier, but now the biomolecules will come along for the ride. So we published the first instantiation of this idea that we call expansion microscopy a couple years ago. In panel B here, you can see a piece of mouse brain tissue before we expanded it. And then panel C, you can see what it looked like some number of hours later. We were able to swallow about 100 fold in volume. Um, you can swallow it larger, but you, uh, the, the problem is that you want to preserve the integrity of the organization of the biomolecule. So as you can see in this little schematic here, we start with a very densely synthesized polymer gel, and then we add water and can swallow it. You can make it swell bigger by eliminating some of these crosslinker sites that keep the polymer in that spider web like configuration. But if you do that, of course, then the threads will move independently and you end up with some disorganization. So here's a little time lapse movie of an actual piece of mouse brain tissue, about sped up 50 times. And here you can see we just added water to the polymer embedded brain. And um, it's kind of fun to watch these things. You can swell brains and shrink them all day long on your desk if you want, which I did for a day or two until I had to do real work. Um, and so the whole process uh, is pretty uh, fast and inexpensive to perform. So we designed everything to be isotropic. We designed the topology, the polymer nature. We thought about what the meaning of the Tanaka phase transitions was. But you know, this is biology, so you have to prove it. You can't just think about it. And so we spent a lot of time validating. And the validations come in a couple different ways. I'll just tell you one of the examples, given that these are sort of short form talks, which is to look at known structures. So for example, we know a lot about microtubules in cells, thanks to lots of years of ground truth EM data. Um, and you can take uh, microtubules in cells, uh, label them with antibodies uh, with fluorophores attached, and then you can um, compare unexpanded cells to expanded cells. These, of course, would be much bigger, but we shrank them down to fit them on the slide. And then we can compare the microtubules to what we know they should look like, you know, deconvolve our image by the known ground truth, of course, decorated with the antibodies and so forth. And if you do that for this expansion of about five-fold, we get a resolution of around 60 nanometers. And that makes sense. We're using a 300 nanometer or so diffraction limited lens, and 300 divided by, you know, the cube root of 100, which is about five, you know, gives us around 60 nanometers. Now, we know from older studies using x-rays that the fundamental limit might be very, very good. The so-called mesh size, or spacing between the polymer threads, has been shown to be only one to two nanometers. And so it raised the question, you know, if we're still limited in some ways by our microscope resolution, could you expand even bigger? Could you really get down to single molecule precision? Before we get there, though, even with this five-fold expansion, there are lots of things you can do now that were very difficult or sometimes even impossible to do before. And so one thing we're already doing a lot of is expanding entire brain circuits that could contain thousands or even sometimes millions of neurons, and then you could image them using microscopes that you already have. So here's some examples of phi one yfp mice. These express yellow fluorescent protein in certain cells in the cortex, hippocampus. And then you can see a little box here. So we're going to zoom in. And now you can see two cell bodies and some purplish dots. And now we're going to zoom in again and see one branch of a neuron. And the purplish dots still look fuzzy. We fit the resolution limit of the microscope. After expansion, though, these are all pre-expansion on the left. After expansion, though, we can see much crisper uh, images. And in fact, we can even resolve the pre- and post-synaptic sides of neural connections, synapses. And the spacing between the centroids of these protein distributions is basically identical to what people had seen using older super resolution methods like STORM. This is from Catherine uh, Dulac and Zhao Wei Zhuang's group, the comparison data. This is our data. Um, but of course, you know, those are, are technologies that are difficult to apply to extended 3D objects like brain circuits. So a common question I get is, well, you just blew it up. Doesn't it take longer to image? And the answer is all super resolution methods are going to be slower than their diffraction limited counterparts. But one way to look at it is we kind of have a best of both worlds kind of technology here. We get the speeds of imaging, of diffraction limited imaging, but the resolution of super resolution. And so you know, we routinely will do um, multicolor imaging of 
pieces of brain tissue with thousands of cells, and we can zoom all the way into individual synaptic connections. Um, but we can do that with very, very fast uh, spinning disk confocal and light sheet and other kinds of microscopes. And the latter is very interesting because when you swell these, you fill them with water. So the final product is like 99% water. And so they're about as clear as a biological specimen can get. Um, and we're collaborating with Eric Betzig, uh, who developed palm microscopy, uh, and are actually doing some measurements of how much optical aberration you get in these kinds of expanded samples. And um, you can shine light from the side and take a picture from the top. And it's so clear that you can get a really crystallinely beautiful image. Um, and you can go at blazingly fast speeds because every single camera frame lets you take a whole two-dimensional two section of your specimen. So here's a piece of mouse brain before we expanded it. And here it is after we expanded it. And you can barely see the boundary. It's so transparent because it's been filled with water. So that's a nice byproduct of our strategy. So what kinds of things can we do in a quantitative sense? Well, here is um, a piece of mouse brain tissue, part of the hippocampus, which is involved with memory formation, amongst other things. And um, it's been color coded. And how we do that is we express random proteins in different cells using viruses. This is the rainbow strategy pioneered by the Lichtman lab at Harvard. Um, and so this green neuron got one protein. This blue neuron got a second protein. This aqua neuron maybe got one of each. We, lay, we come in and, and fluorescently label these proteins so that we can have them glow and we can see them. And so Brainbow has been very uh, cool in terms of making these beautiful pictures. But if you zoom in on your microscope, it's really hard to see axons, dendrites, and other neural processes because they're all smaller than the resolution limit of uh, optical microscopy um, at scale, anyway. Um, and as you can see here, there's a little green banana. It's very hard to see what's going on. That's before expansion. But after expansion, you can see one, two, three, and four axonal processes that are all running parallel to each other. And it turns out there's all sorts of questions in biology, you know, and consistent with the theme of, you know, the, the conference of linking morphology and function, where there's a big question about how that happens. You know, one of the most famous examples is in, in neuroscience that you have one nucleus, but 10,000 synapses. And regulating synaptic strength is so important for all sorts of things, from development to learning to memory. And when it goes wrong, it can result in different disease states. But how do you do that? How do you regulate the, the expression of genes across a thousand different sites? And so a very interesting arena has been to explore how gene expression products like RNAs are stored in different parts of cells for later use. And so um, in work that uh, was uh, co spearheaded by Oz Wasi when he joined the group, we started looking at um, intact brain circuits, expanding them, and then labeling individual RNA molecules. So for the first time, we can really image individual RNA molecules in intact brain circuits with nanoscale precision. Um, and one of the nice things about this is that it's really hard to do single molecule imaging uh, in, in extended specimens. But by decrowding all the molecules, by expanding them away from each other, we can make, make enough room that we can run interesting chemical reactions that amplify the number of fluorophores attached to each biomolecule. And that's what we did here using the HCR reaction developed by the Pierce lab at Caltech. Um, we were able to attach perhaps dozens, maybe even hundreds of fluorophores to different RNAs, making them easy to visualize even in these extended circuits. Now, as I mentioned earlier, we're nowhere near the physical limits of what expansion can do. And so one of the questions we had is, why can't we just blow something up until you could you know, resolve every molecule from every other one? So Ji Bum Chang, when he was a postdoc in the group, uh, tried a bunch of things out. We tried you know, lowering the cross-linkers so the polymers could spread further. Uh, but all those strategies resulted in higher error and floppy, fragile things. Um, so one thought we started to explore uh, around the time that uh, we were about to give up on you know, floppy extend, expanded things was the following idea. Take a piece of brain tissue or whatever and form the polymers and expand, like I told you already. But here's the new part. Form a second polymer in the space opened up by the first expansion, and now you can expand it again. And the final density of polymer is the same about as what you'd expect after a single round of expansion. So it's just as strong and robust as you'd expect after one round of expansion. And that turned out to be true. So it's kind of like PCR, but for space. You know, you want to amplify exponentially, but here, here we are ex amplifying exponentially in the spatial dimension. And we've actually done three rounds, and now we're actually, we're actually working on four rounds as well, which is kind of fun. You do need to transfer the information from the first polymer to the second. There are all sorts of ways to do that, um, which I won't go into detail um, because we already published this version, but, um, but it's, it's also a really fun idea. Can you build sort of biological copy machines that will copy information from one kind of substrate to another and use that to manipulate information um, at the morphological level in situ. Anyway, with this double expansion, we're getting really uh, incredible resolution images, and we're having a lot of fun now starting to look at very fine compartments of neurons. Um, so here's a piece of those uh, rainbow brains, like I showed you earlier, unexpanded. 
um, beautiful but hard to resolve. After one round of expansion, you can resolve many of the axons and dendrites, but some of the synapses are still a little bit fuzzy. After two rounds of expansion, you can now resolve very fine compartments, even delicate spine necks and other areas of uh, uh, neural circuits. And if you look carefully, it looks very speckly, and that's because we're basically getting down to single molecules here. These are the proteins that were expressed in the rainbow labeled brains, um, but we're um, getting down to really the fundamental limits there. Uh, Yongshun Zhao and Octavian Bricur, working across my group and Andy Beck's group, recently showed that we could use this on human tissues. And so these are a bunch of human uh, breast cancer patient uh, uh, biopsies, pre-expansion and post-expansion. Um, you know, to take a long story short, we can get very good resolution imaging of pathology specimens, uh, which is really exciting because nobody's done um, nanoscale light microscopy of pathology specimens before, to my knowledge. And so we've applied it to a whole variety of human tissues. These, I know it's a crowded slide, but suffice it to say that we looked at prostate, lung, breast, pancreas, a whole bunch of different organ systems, and, and looked at both regular as well as cancer-containing biopsies. Um, and one of the things that Andy's group did with us was uh, to try to tackle a problem, which is difficult, uh, namely early breast cancer diagnosis. So uh, there's an article in the Journal of the American Medical Association commenting that you know, for early breast cancer lesions, pathologists can disagree 25, maybe 50% of the time, which is a lot. And so to make a long story short, uh, what we did was have a panel of experts grade pre-expansion versus post-expansion images and what they thought they were, you know, normal, precancerous, full bone cancer, and so forth, and then train a machine learning algorithm to try to discriminate between these different categories. And so uh, the, the pre-expansion images uh, were a bit hard to uh, consistently train the machine learning algorithm on, but post-expansion images did much better. And so we're actually in the process now of spinning out a company to try to do a larger scale study in order to see if we can actually uh, improve the ability of um, individual doctors to diagnose early cancers as a result of this. So to summar so summarize, uh, you know, expansion turns out to be a very practical way of imaging uh, cells and tissues with nanoscale precision. And because you don't require any hardware you don't, you don't already have, it's been spreading very quickly. So people have applied it to everything from human epileptic patients to you know, viral spread in tunneling nanotubes to Drosophila synapses and everything in between. And we host people almost every week in our group to learn how to do it. So if anybody is interested, you can see the protocols at our website or you can drop me a line and come hang out. So that's a spatial story I wanted to talk about. And we're having a lot of fun really mapping brain circuits with it. Uh, but I wanted to also tell you about time as well, because of course, everything I've showed you so far works on preserved brain tissues, which is a euphemism for dead brain tissues. And we need to, of course, be able to observe and control brain circuits uh, in real time as well. And so one thing we've been working a lot on is whether we could control neurons in intact brain circuits. Because if you could activate neurons and activate their electrical activities, you could try to figure out what kinds of behaviors or pathological states that those neurons would trigger. Um, or if you shut them down, then you could find out what they're necessary for. And by using the two in combination, you could do very interesting computationally inspired neuroscientific analyses. And so the way we chose to control was using light uh, because with light, of course, it's as fast as anything gets, and the brain is fast, but not as fast as light. And of course, light can be aimed at cells, which is also very helpful if you want to activate one cell, but not its neighbor. And so all sorts of people have come up with interesting hardware for getting light into the brain. But today I want to talk about what we're doing uh, in order to make these, uh, you know, the, the actual technology work. And the beauty here is we could actually borrow molecules from the natural world that can make this happen. So microbial opsins, um, I think you've heard a little bit already uh, from Adam's talk, uh, but we can find these molecules from the natural world. They convert light into electrical energy or light into different kinds of electrical signals. There are light-driven proton pumps that are found in microbes that live in very salty water. Uh, there are light-driven chloride pumps that are also found in these microbes. And the light-driven ion channels that also occur in the natural world, you know, being channels, they can't really store energy, but they can sense light and convert that information, um, in this case, for helping single-celled algae to navigate around. And so the light-driven proton pumps, light-driven chloride pumps, and light-driven ion channels have been studied for, for decades. Um, but what we've been doing, and our colleagues and collaborators, is trying to figure out if we can actually find ones that are safe, effective, and fast enough, and so forth, for controlling neural activity. And so the good news is, members of all three of these classes, proton pumps, chloride pumps, and ion channels, can be found that are safe and effective in, in neurons. So if you pump protons out of a neuron, this is work done by Brian Chow and Shia Han when they were postdocs in the group, you can silence the neuron, if you pump chloride in, and so we're done by Xu and Amy Chuang, uh, you can shut down neurons. And then if you uh, bring positive ions in through light-driven ion channels that pass, for example, protons or sodium, you can activate them. This is work that originally I did collaborate with Carl Geiseroth when we were both at Stanford. And then um, Nathan Kopecki in my group had uh, continued this when he was a student. 
So literally, uh, you know, thousands of groups are using these kinds of technologies to control neurons. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll just give you one example that I find kind of fun, uh, which was spearheaded by my close collaborator, Li Wei Tsai at MIT. And uh, she was very interested in Alzheimer's disease, still is. Um, and what she chose to do was to use one of these molecules, a blue light-driven ion channel the, the, from algae, the very same one that Carl and I put into neurons over a decade ago. And uh, they put this in, uh, gene into the brains of Alzheimer's model mice and then drove uh, the neurons at a specific frequency, 40 times a second. And to everybody's su surprise, to be honest, I didn't quite believe it when I first saw the data, um, this caused in the Alzheimer's model mice the amyloid plaques and some of the other molecular hallmarks of Alzheimer's to decrease. And so this is a very interesting coupling between neural activity, and now uh, we're understanding this more and more. Uh, microglial cells uh, are, uh, and other cells are changing and uh, being able to effectively uh, clean up and reprogram their local neuronal environment in ways that are revealing lots of very interesting signaling cascades that um, are, are, are very new and, and curious. Uh, Emory Brown, the anesthesiologist at MIT, uh, made the interesting suggestion, what if you tried to do this without the optogenetics? So the next experiment was to take mice and show them just a flickering light, no optogenetics anymore. They're just watching a light blinking on the ceiling. And even more to all of our surprises, uh, that also cleaned up the amyloid plaques. And so uh, Li Wei and I actually just co-founded a company to try to see if we can do human trials of uh, effectively movies that might help people with Alzheimer's disease. Um, so it's still early days, and, uh, but I'm very excited about the possibilities there. This is work co spearheaded by Hannah Iacarino and Li Wei's group and Annabelle Singer, who was then in my group. So what are we doing? Well, we're trying to push the tools to their physical limits. We want to make them as powerful as possible. Just one quick example is, um, you know, uh, blue light and red light go to different depths of the body. You know, red light's less absorbed by blood and other components of tissues. Um, let's see, this, this is a red laser point. It's quite weak, but I guess you can't really see it very well, but you can see my finger lighting up, despite the fact that it's probably, you know, a fraction of a milliwatt of, of laser power. Um, so Nathan Kropecki, when he was in the group, worked on screening uh, over a, a, a thousand plant genomes, including over a hundred algae, and we found a molecule that we called crimson, which can respond to uh, 735 nanometer light, red or nearly infrared light, 100 nanometers redder than this laser pointer. And so people are now using this to activate large volumes because you can shine red light and it'll go deeper into the brain or the body than other colors of light. Um, but the holy grail, of course, is can we actually start to program, you know, cells one by one in the brain? And so one of the things we're doing right now in a collaboration with Valentina Miliani's group, her group in Paris works on holographic projection optics for multi-photon microscopy, which is a way of saying, can you sculpt light in 3D so the light will hit just the cells you want and not all the cells that you don't want? This is the work spearheaded by Orsh and Esch in my group and a number of people in Valentina's group. So the tricky part, of course, is, well, can you make it precise enough that you could hit just one cell? And one thing that is tricky is that if you try to hit just one cell, with light, there's still a problem, which is that axons and dendrites from other cells could still be nearby. And so what Orr did was to launch a screen, both to look for opsins that were powerful enough to mediate very strong control if you somehow could localize them to the cell body, and then to screen for peptides that you could append to those opsins that would target those to the cell body. And this is an active area, the clean Bolton at the Max Planck Institute Florida had done uh, work on another peptide and an older opsin, um, and Zhao Wapan at Wayne State. Um, but we really wanted to find an optimal combination of opsin and targeting motifs so we could really molecularly focus these molecules at the cell body and then optically focus the light to the cell bodies as well. And so we looked at a molecule that Nathan had discovered, and he was a student in the lab, which we call COCHR, um, which is really, really strong. It has maybe order of magnitude improved currents over um, the original Chadorad opsin that Carl and I put into drawings many years ago. If you express it with a virus, then it goes everywhere, of course. But if you append a very specific peptide, um, to the C terminus, then you can get it to locate almost exclusively at the cell body. So if you record one cell and then photostimulate lots of others, you often will get crosstalk because the cell's process is wandering nearby. But here, if you uh, record a cell and photostimulate others, then you won't get that because you um, are stimulating cells that uh, are located near axons and dendrites, but the axons and dendrites don't have any optically sensitive molecules. And that's what you really see here in the lower right-hand corner. I know it's a busy slide, but just focus on the lower right. Um, with the, the wild type, very powerful opsin, COCHR, if you record one cell and stimulate other cells, maybe up to half the time you get spiking crosstalk in the cell you care about. But if you target the cell body, then you get 0% um, of the time uh, action potentials driven in the neuron of interest. So the dream here really is to try to build tools that help unify the structure and function of the nervous system so we can build computational models. And I've told you today about two of these tools, expansion microscopy for mapping, 
the molecular anatomy of things and control, uh, you know, with optogenetics, we can try to control genetics. And it's really exciting. We're starting a number of collaborations with Adam's group uh, also to think about new strategies to help look at uh, sort of the third leg of this tripod as well. Um, and to, if we can bring all three together, this could really help. Uh, the dream is to build new computational models of how neural systems mediate behavior. So I think I'll end there, and thank you for your time. Yeah, so um, crimson wild type has pretty uh, poor kinetics, as shown here. But um, if we make one mutation, which is essentially the, uh, the analogous to the H134R mutation that's famous for chimerodopsin 2, uh, then you actually get decent kinetics. So the recovery time constants get better, um, the rundown gets better, and uh, it, it's pretty comparable to the CHR2H134R mutation. Um, Uh, we have actually, yeah, yeah. We have some that we're playing with right now. Yeah, if you want to try them out, we'd love to give them to people. It's unclear whether there's enough bandwidth in the lab to do all the demos to make them into a like a big paper, but we'll just give them to whoever wants. So, other questions? It's working pretty well. So what Yang Shen and Octavian uh, worked out, um, they were very obsessed with getting this to work in the pathology arena, is that they, uh, they got um, specimens, human specimens, of uh, uh, prostate, lung, breast, and pancreas. And then in the paper, which was in Nature Biotechnology a couple months ago, they also did skin, ovary, liver, kidney, colon, um, basically all the things that we get our hands on from our pathology uh, collaborators. And, and all of it worked pretty well. Um, the major problem was not actually adapting it to different tissue types so much as adapting it to the weird ways that pathologists store human tissue in fixatives for long periods of time. We had to reverse some of the over chemical uh, preservation strategies that are great for archival uh, repositories, but maybe not so great if you want to expand something. You mentioned that to expand the tissues, you expose them to some kind of chemical treatment that uh, breaks down uh, interactions between different proteins or uh, other biomolecules. But yet you had one example where you had antibodies, which require an interaction between the antibody and the thing you're staining with it. So uh, how does that work? And also, if you can do that, can you also uh, create a situation where you don't disrupt some kind of dimer and you can actually visualize that using this technology? Sure. So two answers to your questions. The first is um, there are two ways that we do the expansion. One is higher performance but more finicky. The other is maybe you know, lower performance but very reliable. Uh, the low performance but very reliable ways, you add the antibodies beforehand uh, with the fluorophores attached, then form the polymer, uh, use proteases to chop up everything but the antibodies, because antibodies are pretty protease resistant, and then expand. So that works well because the antibodies are administered at the first step, which is when it's familiar to administer them. But uh, because you haven't decrowded the proteins from each other, you don't get quite the same binding as if you were to move them apart first. And that brings me to the, to the higher performance, but more finicky version, but it's honestly what we do most of the time in-house. You can anchor the proteins, apply high temperatures and detergents and loosen them up from each other, pull them apart, and then apply the antibodies. And some of the antibodies will fail at that time. I think we have a hit rate of around 75% right now. Um, uh, but frankly, a lot of the antibodies uh, that work well, you know, uh, uh, do work well even if you apply them after expansion. Um, but the, the beauty of that is you move the proteins apart. So now you can potentially bind at sites that would be covert or hidden in the normal state. And so we're doing a number of experiments right now trying to look at uh, protein complexes, you know, at the synapse, at other areas, and see if we can make sort of a a 3D map of how the proteins are organized there. Um, let's see, what was your second question? Uh, about if you can image dimers without pulling them apart or something like that. Great question. Yeah, so everything I've talked about up to, to now, we validated down to around the 15 to 25 nanometer range. So uh, I would say we don't quite know what happens below that range in terms of objective multi-tissue validated uh, protocols. That's really where the main focus in our group is right now, in addition to the brain mapping stuff is indeed to, to understand uh, how uh, expanding protein complexes uh, 
manipulates individual components of a complex. So for example, one of the ideas that we're playing with is, could you take a virus and expand a virus? You know, are there things, again, where we know the ground truth organization, and if we can expand it, we will then know whether the proteins are coming apart one by one, or oops, there was a clump there, and can we optimize it? So I think that's going to be an interesting area in the next couple of years. So I was interested in um, the expansion properties, if it's linear or if there's any warping properties that occur and how you would kind of accommodate, you know, what, what's going to happen with that warping, if so? Yeah. So all of the examples that I've shown here, uh, the amount of distortion, you know, if we take pre-expansion images versus post-expansion images and then do a non-rigid registration, um, and all these papers have that data in them, uh, there is a non-zero distortion. It's around maybe a couple percent over link scales of some tens or hundreds of microns. So the good news is um, it's pretty low, and for the vast majority of biological and medical questions, you know, a 1% or to 4% difference in length might not be that important. Um, and I think that's contributed to the popularity of it. Um, but uh, we are working on making the, the polymers even more precise. Um, but uh, I think it, it's going to be a fairly specialized set of scientific questions where you really, really care about exact distances at that level of precision. But we want to make it happen. Great. Let's say Great. Thank you.